it's top 10 time i'll be honest with you i was going to do one video before this one but i only had time to record a single video this week and i'm just so excited to get this one done plus i didn't want to keep you waiting any longer i know how you've been lying awake at night with the tension and the anxiety of wondering what these top 10 games could possibly be so let's not wait any longer let's get right to it So here's the plan of action. I'm going to start off by talking about a couple of honorable mentions. Then I'm going to discuss a few potential changes to this list that have occurred just in the several weeks it's taken me to put out these six videos. And speaking of that, I'm going to let you know that I have about 68 pages of script for these six videos that I've written here. Although it is in 14 point font so I can actually read it. But the point is I've spent probably between 20 to 25 hours of work per video for each of these six videos to put this all together. So all that is just to try to guilt you to click subscribe or like. I would really appreciate that. through my top 10 games. And finally, I'm gonna wrap it up with what I think are some very interesting statistics regarding both years that the games in my top 60 were published, as well as a comparison to an old list that I found from six years ago. So that should be really interesting to wrap up with, I think. And I hope you'll just grab a drink, settle in, and ride along with me for this final top 10 games. So let's start with honorable mentions. I said from the outset that these top 60 games have to be games that I currently have on my shelves in my collection. And there really are only a few games that I don't own that might crack the top 60, including maybe a couple that a friend owns that I don't necessarily feel I need to purchase as well. One example with that would be Super Motherload. That's a really interesting little deck building mining game that I enjoy a lot, but my friend has so I do have the opportunity to play it. And another big example there would be with legacy games. The thing with legacy games is once you're through the campaign, regardless of what the legacy game says about being able to continue to play the game afterwards, I find in my experience that once I've gotten my, I don't know how many games, 18 to 20 plays out of the game, I'm ready to leave it behind. I've had my enjoyment with it and I've gotten a lot more play out of the game typically than with a lot of the games I have on my own shelves here. So. There is a game that I rate 10 out of 10 that, were it in my collection, would be very close to the top of this list and would probably be, well, it would certainly be in the top 10 here, and that is Pandemic Legacy Season 1. That game provided me with some of the most incredible, amazing gameplay experiences I've ever had with any game, and it was just such a wondrous experience to go through that game and the sense of discovery and awe with how it all came together was just amazing. And then Pandemic Legacy Season 2 provided another great experience. I didn't quite enjoy it as much as the first season. That's possibly because maybe some of the magic was lost a little bit. We'd already experienced all the just amazing newness of it. And there were just a couple of things with the gameplay that I didn't like as much. But I would still probably give Season 2 a rating of maybe 9 out of 10. So so it's still very high up there. So those are games that certainly would make the list had they been in my collection. Now I have added a couple of games to my collection that I'm certain will hit the top 60. In fact, one of them has already. One of these new games that I've already played and have rated 7.5 out of 10 has been slotted into my number 39 position. And that one is Pandemic Fall of Rome. Again with the pandemic theme here, but here's the thing, I felt that with the original Pandemic game, after my wife had gotten that and played it a lot, it eventually felt played out and I sold that game. And then along came the Legacy versions and I got right back into it and loved it, like I said. But after playing through a couple of Legacy games, again, I was feeling burned out on the whole Pandemic thing. And then along comes Fall of Rome here with its really interesting historical theme and its amazing new twists on the rules. And I'm really back on the Pandemic band 
bandwagon again. So that one is definitely in my top 60 now. The other that I'm hopeful will end up high in that top 60 is a game I got for Christmas but haven't yet had a chance to play yet. And that is the Golden Ages, a light civilization themed game that I'm eager to try out. In fact, the expansion for it just arrived in the mail. So now I also have the cults and culture expansion with the base game and I'm excited to give it a shot. If you don't count expansions, this is only one of two games on my shelves here that I have not played yet. I will talk about the other one later. There are a few expansions in some of these other games that I haven't yet had a chance to try out, but in terms of full games, this is only one of two that I have not played. There's one other small thing that I think would change in this top 60 list, and that is when I did my previous video, I felt that Lords of Zidit was just a little too high up in the ranking. When I saw it alongside some of the other games that I really loved, it didn't quite feel right. So I'll definitely be dropping that a few rankings, but it will still be up pretty high in the top 60. But enough of that, let's get into the top 10. Number 10 is Colt Express, designed by Christophe Rimbaud and published by Ludonaut. In terms of expansions, I own the Horses and Stagecoach and Marshall and Prisoners expansions. And while I highly recommend the Horses and Stagecoach expansion, I felt that the Marshall and Prisoners overburdened what is meant to be a light and fun game, though I could see keeping just the Prisoners part of the expansion in the game in future plays. I rate the game 9 out of 10, and this is one that my wife really enjoys a lot too. The number of players shown on the box is 2 to 6, but I would say you get your best experience at about 4 to 6 because it's one of these highly interactive games where if there's not enough players to interact with each other, it's just not as fun or funny an experience. The list of play time is 40 minutes. I'd say realistically that might be closer to an hour. And the complexity I have at 4 out of 10. You basically play some cards and see what happens. Like Lords of Zidit and Kings of Air and Steam, Colt Express is a game of programming actions and then seeing how badly your plans get messed up by your opponent's programmed actions. The difference with Colt Express is that there are more opportunities to directly mess with your opponents, which leads to much more chaos and fewer opportunities to see your carefully crafted plans come to fruition. Well, I would normally see this as a negative in most games. With this one, it tends to lead to a lot of laughter and fun if you approach the game in that spirit and don't take it too seriously. And then the whole experience is further elevated by outrageously awesome components that are totally worth the nuisance of having to reach little fingers into small train cars without knocking everything around. If you don't take it too seriously and you don't get too upset when other people mess up your plans, you're almost guaranteed to have a great time with Colt Express. Number 9 is Clank, a deck building adventure. It was designed by Paul Denon and I was interested to discover that the only design credits he has are for Clank and all his various spin-offs like the expansions for Clank and Clank in Space and all that sort of stuff. Speaking of expansions, I own literally everything for this version of Clank including Sunken Treasures, The Mummy's Curse, Golden Silk, and the Snack Table promo. The newest expansion, Golden Silk is actually the first expansion I recommend to people who just have the base game because it doesn't require messing around with card decks or other annoying setup fiddliness. My rating is 9 out of 10 and I would bet that my wife's would be pretty close to that if not the same as well. The number of players on the box is 2 to 4 and it does scale well with 2 to 4. I've played it a lot of times at all player accounts and always had fun with it. The playtime listed is 30 to 60 minutes. Realistically, yeah, maybe a little more than an hour. It all depends on how quickly people decide to get in and out of the dungeon. I have the complexity at 4 out of 10. Even the small twists that the expansions add aren't really too tough to handle. We love Clank. This game was a massive hit with my wife and I from our very first play and has become one of our most played games in the past couple of years. It's quite a remarkable mix of a board based deck building game with a very strong push your luck element that is very cleverly based around making noise or clank. 
Players are adventurers who must delve into a dragon-guarded dungeon and come out with the most loot. The most valuable treasures are in fact the deepest in the dungeon and the hardest to reach, but at some point each player must make a decision to turn back to the surface or risk not getting out of the dungeon at all. I love it when my deck building games have a board where the action happens, and Clank and the Quest for El Dorado are my very favorite games that are built around the deck building mechanism. Super Motherload, which I mentioned in my honorable mentions, is another one that I'd probably own if my friend didn't already have it. Number eight is 870, <laughs> I didn't do that on purpose either, is 878 Vikings Invasions of England. It comes from the design trio of Bo Beckett, Dave Kimmel, and Steph Stahl, and it was published by Academy Games Incorporated. I do own the Viking Age expansion for this one. Now, this is the game that is going to destroy any credibility I had with this entire countdown thing, because well, I haven't actually played this game before. So yeah, that's right. I have a game that I've never played as my number eight game of all time. But bear with me a minute and I'll try to explain that. So my forecasted rating for this game is 9 out of 10 based on the fact that I have played 1812 The Invasion of Canada and 1775 Rebellion and I've read through the rules of this one to see how the system has evolved and has been adapted to the Viking setting. So I am very familiar with the system that this game is based on and I'm really pretty excited by what they have done with it for this particular game. As for my wife, I don't really see that it would be her type of game, unfortunately. The number of players listed on the box is two to four, and the ideal number of players for these games does tend to scale well from two and up. However, they are best with a full player count because they are in a very rare category of games that are team versus team. Unfortunately, that's not very common in board games, it seems. If you do have team situations, often it's either a fully cooperative game where everyone's working together or it's one versus many. So in this instance, I think you would get the best and most enjoyable experience as a two versus two team game. The playtime shown on the box is one to two hours and based on past experiences with the other games in the system, I'm saying you're probably going to want about two hours if you're playing the full game. They do tend to include scenarios for shorter versions of their games, but to get the whole experience you want the upper time limit there. The complexity I'm going to guess is about 5 out of 10 based again on reading through the rules. It's perhaps a smidgen higher with all the expansion stuff thrown in, having a read through the Viking Age expansion rule book, it does seem that there are quite a few things that could be added if you want and if you don't mind the complexity going up somewhat. The games in Academy Games' Birth of America slash Birth of Europe series absolutely blow my mind with how much historical nuance they are able to capture with such a minimalist set of rules and a handful of cards and dice. Everyone just needs to throw out their copies of Risk right now and grab one of these games. Having read through the rules of this one, I'm very excited by the direction they've gone with the Invasion of the Norsemen. And have I mentioned that I'm dying to play it? Although I don't mind having some more time because I need to paint up all those cool leaders and buildings that I got with the expansion. Meanwhile, watch your back England, there's boats a-coming! Number seven is The Boss. It was designed by Alain Ollier and published by Blackrock Games. I own the expansion called the five to six player expansion. My rating is nine out of 10, and I'm not exactly sure what my wife's rating would be. It's been quite some time since we've played the game, but I think she thought it was okay in the past. The number of players shown on the box is two to four, but I don't think it's a really great two player game. Ideally, you want three or four, or if you have that expansion, you'd want three to six. The playtime shown on the box is 20 
20 to 60 minutes, which I guess they're going with 10 minutes per player roughly. So realistically, I'm saying about 45 minutes for an average play. The complexity I have at just three out of 10, it's pretty easy once you get rolling with it. The boss is a deceptively clever game of deduction, bluffing, and area control packed into this tiny little box. Players are mobsters who are attempting to bring in the most money through control of various cities, but they have to be careful about which cities they send their mobsters to because the rewards are hidden and not all of them are positive. So you could end up thrown in jail or worse. The deduction and bluffing come into play through a cleverly simple system where the back of the cards are a different color for each city. So based on looking at the other players' hands that they're holding, you can see what cities they have the most information for and analyze how they're playing their mobsters in relation to that but perhaps they're trying to trick you and draw you into a city that has one of those dangerous rewards as more cards are revealed more information about each city is discovered until it's all finally revealed at the end of a round unlike in real life I love the boss yet for some weird reason it hasn't actually gotten to the table in years now I'm going to have to rectify that soon. Number six is the Battles of Westeros series. It was designed by Robert A. Kuba, who, interestingly enough, co-designed the second edition of Battle Lore with Richard Borg. He also co-designed Merchant of Venus second edition with Richard Hamblin, and he co-designed Descent the Road to Legend with Kevin Wilson. So he seems to be one of these designers who can take an already amazing game and somehow make it even better. This was published by Fantasy Flight Games, and once again, I own literally everything for this series. I have Wardens of the North, Wardens of the West, Lords of the River, Tribes of the Vale, Brotherhood Without Banners, the House Baratheon Army Expansion, and some promo cards. I rate the game 9 out of 10, and my wife has not played it because it's unlikely that she'd be interested in this system, I think. The number of players on the box is 2 players, because it's strictly a 2 player game, and the playtime listed is 1 to 2 hours, I guess that would be scenario dependent, but you definitely want a couple of hours, especially if you're taking into account the setup and teardown, which would extend that even further. The complexity I have very high at 8 out of 10. There are lots of special rules for things, which is not helped by a terrible rule book. It's bad enough that a fan of the game named Ian McCarthy took the time to completely rewrite it a couple of times. You can actually find version 5 of his rules rewrite on BoardGameGeek.com if you go to the Battles of Westeros files page and look for Ian's username, which is Ken Toad. So let me tell you a bit about my gaming history for a second. Back in the mid-2000s, when my wife and I were discovering the world of modern board games, one of the earlier two-player games I can remember playing regularly together was an American Civil War game by Richard Borg called Battle Cry. It turns out that this was the first in a series of games that became known as the Commands and Colors series, or C&C for short. The next in that line of games that I would purchase and enjoy for quite a long time was the original Battle Lore and a few of its more historically oriented expansions. But then when Battles of Westeros came out and I saw how the system had evolved, I sold my Battle Lore stuff and picked up this one. On a bit of a tangential note, I will admit that I came here all prepared to complain about the fact that Battles of Westeros is not included in the Commands and Colors family of games, even though it shares the same framework. And then I was writing this video script and doing my usual research, when lo and behold, I noticed that Battles of Westeros is now included in the CNC line on Board Game Geek. So I'll continue to say what I've always said, which is that this is the best of the Commands and Color series, except now this will be a more accurate statement. But anyhow, I knew nothing about A Song of Ice and Fire slash Game of Thrones prior to owning this game, and I only decided to check out the TV series as a result of purchasing this game. And then I ended up giving up after season one out of a complete lack of interest in trying to keep track of who all was mad at who and for what reasons. 
But as for the game itself, while I've never played a true miniatures game with armies of minis and rulers and terrain and all that, I feel that this game allows me to dip my toes into a similar puddle without having to dive into the ocean of a miniatures system. I have played through the first several scenarios of the base game in the distant past, and I love how the game revolves around the leaders on the battlefield rather than the typical left, center, right battlefield sections of a typical CNC game. This isn't a game for people who don't like a whole lot of fiddly rules, but for people who do want a highly tactical game of many different types of soldiers with different strengths and weaknesses clashing on a battlefield with various terrain types, and who are okay Okay with having several player aids close at hand, I feel that it cannot be beat. I certainly have everything for this wonderful, scenario-based game of clashing armies and factions, except someone to play it with. Top 5 time now, with Clash of Cultures coming in at that number 5 position. This one was designed by Christian Markison and published by Zedman Games. As you can see, I own the Civilizations expansion and I do own the Aztecs promo as well. And I will say that I did have the honor of playing a very small role in the development of this expansion. I rate the game 9.5 out of 10, and interestingly enough, my wife would probably rate it roughly the same. She actually cites it as one of her very favorite board games of all time. The number of players stated on the box is 2 to 4. You ideally want 3 to 4, although you can get a good two player experience, which I'm going to talk about in a minute. The listed playtime is 3 hours. I think you'd want even more than that, maybe 4 hours to get the full experience. The complexity I have at 9 out of 10. Like Christian Markison's other game, Merchants and Marauders, it's highly complex with loads of rules, plus rules exceptions for tech advances and so forth. But if you're cool with that, this is the Civ game you are looking for. What this is not is that mystical holy grail of board gaming, a Civ light game. Yes, we all want a game that will give us a satisfying civilization experience in under two hours without a novel length rule book. And I still recall all the excitement way back in 2005 when Antique and Tempest were announced, one of which had some marginal success. And yes, I have continued that search as recently as Christmas time when I got the Golden Ages like I showed you before. But here's the thing, if you want that full, rich experience of starting in a blank, undiscovered world with nothing but a hut and a human, of going forth and exploring that world and discovering different land types that yield different resources, but also discovering unfriendly barbarian types, of gathering those resources and using them to build cities, grow your civilization, start a military, and discover technological advances, of dealing with the random events that sweep into the world and disturb the balance of things, of clashing with other mighty civilizations in epic battles, of spreading not just your military might but also your culture into the world, of continuing to grow and learn and improve and influence and subdue until you are the mightiest people on the planet, then you're going to have to devote your time to learning a thick rule book, remembering the rules that are changed as you acquire each new technological advancement, and playing late into the night to see how it all comes to fruition. Some of the things that set Clash of Cultures above many of the other Civ games are as follows. It has a very interesting and thematic web of connections within the tech upgrade system. The culture system allows players to take over individual buildings within other player cities. The cities themselves have a happiness system where players can go hard on activating an individual city at the risk of making that city angry. The map is highly variable and will be different for each game. The physical components are outstanding with beautiful art and amazing plastic figures for each unit type and each building type. 
And finally, unlike in Sid Meier's Civilization's The Board Game from 2010, where players must specialize in either culture, technology, economy, or military to achieve a specific victory, the victory point system in Clash of Cultures encourages players to diversify their civilization. And then, of course, if you can get the expansion, unfortunately it's super hard to find, you will have 14 real-world ancient civilizations you can try out, or 15 if you also find the Aztecs promo, each of these with unique abilities and starting resources, and all of which have historical leaders that can be utilized. And it also comes with elephants and cavalry and new building types and the pirates and so much other great stuff. My only real complaint is that in two-player games, the only viable strategy is the military, since it allows you the double benefit of destroying your opponent's units and taking over their cities without any other players around to counterbalance that. My wife and I, who prefer not to spend the whole game trying to destroy what the other person is trying to build, and instead focus our militaries on the barbarian tribes, overcome this particular obstacle by playing our two-player games on a large, full-size map, which has the effect of making it very costly in terms of actions and time and resources to build up an army, march it all the way across the entire board, and start attacking cities that have other friendly cities nearby where more units can be recruited to fight against you. But other than that and the rules overhead, I really don't have anything negative to say at all about this truly epic game. Yay! Number four is Spectre Ops, which was designed by Emerson Matsuchi and published by Plaid Hat Games. I own Broken Covenant as well, which is both a standalone game and an expansion for the base game. I rate the game 9.5 out of 10, and unfortunately my wife didn't take to this game with the same enthusiasm that I did. The number of players shown on the box is 2 to 5, and it does actually scale really well from 2 to 5, although I haven't tried the full 5 players with the trader mode, which is a very interesting looking way of playing the game. The listed playtime on the box is 1 to 2 hours. Realistically, I'm going to put it at about an hour and a half, although you could go quicker with just two players who are very familiar with the game. With more players, you're going to have that team discussion happening, which is going to really lengthen the gameplay time quite a bit. The complexity I have at 5 out of 10, you just have to remember all your special abilities and your gear and not forget the little things that you can do with your character and that sort of thing. I have covered Spectre Ops at some length in a couple of my other videos, so I won't spend a lot of time on it here. The short version of my history with the whole one versus all hidden movement games is this. Ever since playing Scotland Yard as a child, this has been one of my favorite genres. I've played many of the games in the genre, including, in approximate order of lightest game to heaviest game, Fluch der Mami slash Pyramid slash Pyramid of Penguin, Clue the Great Museum Caper, Whitehall Mystery, Scotland Yard, Garibaldi the Escape, Spectre Ops slash Spectre Ops Broken Covenant, Hunt for the Ring, and Fury of Dracula 2nd and 3rd editions. While Fury of Dracula has been a favorite with my wife and I for years, it is very complex and can run very long with the playtime too. And here's the thing. Spectre Ops basically takes all the best bits of Dracula and distills them down into a fast, furious, tension-filled play experience, much like a vampire sucking the essence out of its victim. It's a thriller novel that starts right at the beginning of the climactic action scene and does not let up on the tension until it's all over just a short time later. I wish I was more into the cyberpunk theme, but the gameplay is just astonishingly good. Look what I have as my number three! It's the entire Mr. Jack family of games. We have the original Mr. Jack base game, the Mr. Jack extension, and check out how the artwork matches up between those two boxes. How cool is that? And we also have Mr. Jack in New York, we have Mr. Jack Pocket, and I'm even going to include in this family Le Fantôme de l'Opéra, as well as another game called Verona Twist. All of these games that you see here were designed by two men named Bruno Catala and Ludovic Moblanc. They were also published by Hurricane Games. 
My very favorite game in this whole lot is Mr. Jack in New York, so I'm going to use this one as the representative game in terms of play time and rating and so forth. So the rating I have of Mr. Jack in New York is 10 out of 10. My wife's rating of the original Mr. Jack base game way back in the day was 4 out of 10. These are all strictly two player games. The playtime shown for Mr. Jack in New York is 30 minutes, although I would say 45 minutes is more realistic unless you can really think fast. The complexity I have for Mr. Jack in New York is 6 out of 10. The complexity is more in the gameplay than the rules, and admittedly the original base game was I think a little less complex, as was the Mr. Jack pocket version, and Le Fantôme de l'Opera was even easier than the Mr. Jack base game. Let me take you all the way back to when I was a little kid. I read many of the Nate the Great books, most of the Hardy Boys books, and all of Arthur Ignatius Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes stories. I had a private investigator kit with a magnifying glass and code books and whatnot, and I loved the board games Clue and Mastermind. And then, as an adult, I became fascinated by those true crime shows such as Dateline and the like. You can imagine my excitement when I got back into board gaming as an adult and discovered that there were other deduction based games other than Clue. And then along came Mr. Jack and I thought, I've heard of this Jack the Ripper character and I'm always up for a good murder mystery. I gotta see what this is all about. So I started reading about Jack the Ripper and I was like, oh, oh god, oh, what? And then I was like, this is the guy they decided to make a cutesy little cartoon game about? No thanks, I'm gonna pass on that. But I just kept hearing great things about this game. And one day, I actually won a free copy from a now defunct online game store called Fun Games Cafe, and I decided I should give it a shot. It turns out that Mr. Jack is basically the love child of Clue and Chess, with the investigator player trying to deduce the identity of the Jack player amongst eight characters who each have their own movement characteristics and or abilities. It's highly tactical and extraordinarily clever in the way in which characters are gradually eliminated as suspects, if the investigator player is doing their job, that is. It can lead to the same brain-melting, several minutes long turns that a game of chess can give you, but I was immediately entranced by the gameplay. And then they came out with a wonderfully implemented online version of the game, which sadly no longer exists. And at some point, I actually became a fairly highly ranked player worldwide for a period of time. And then they started branching out with other stuff, including the Mr. Jack extension, Mr. Jack in New York, Mr. Jack Pocket, and Le Fantôme de l'Opera, which isn't officially in the Mr. Jack family, but, well, I'll explain more in a future video. Because after all, I've devoted videos to looking at my top two games, and I think I would like to do one in the near future where I explore this entire system as a whole. Meanwhile, I will simply say that Mr. Jack in New York is my favorite in this system because it takes the original Mr. Jack and makes it much more open-ended and dynamic, which adds greatly to the strategic complexity. I highly recommend it to experienced Mr. Jack players, but in terms of newcomers to this system, I would point them first to the original base game. And now somebody other than Bruno and Ludovic has taken the basic concept of this system, they've put their own twist on it, and have designed a game called Verona Twist, which I am eager to get hold of, but so far I've been completely unable to find anywhere in Canada because it was produced by a Romanian publisher called Mind Fitness Games. I will continue that search, but in the meantime I already have way more games in this system than I have actual opponents to play them with. Number two is the massively magnificent War of the Ring. There's another design trio behind this one, consisting of Roberto Di Meglio, Marco Maggi, and Francesco Napitello. And it was all published by Ares Games. The edition you're looking at here is the gorgeous anniversary edition. 
as well as the Lords of Middle-Earth expansion and the Warriors of Middle-Earth expansion. And I've purchased a whole bunch of other customization stuff such as strongholds and mountains and card sleeves and other cool stuff to go with my game. I rate this game a perfect 10 out of 10 and my wife has rated it 9 out of 10. The number of players on the box says 2 to 4. Now, despite this official player count, which is undoubtedly there to make more sales, this game was clearly designed for two players, and that's what I would recommend to folks. The playtime shown says 3 plus hours, and realistically you'd want at least 4 hours. If you're just learning the game, you're going to want much longer than that. Or if you do what I do and play with the starting from the Shire variant that a fan of the game made, you're going to actually want closer to 6 hours for a game. Like I said, my rating for the game is 10 out of 10, but my complexity rating is also 10 out of 10. There is so much here to learn, so many rules, and not only that, but the strategic considerations when you actually start into the game are pretty overwhelming. This game was the focus of the second video I ever uploaded on my YouTube channel, which for reasons that I'm at a complete loss to explain, has over 20,000 views as of this recording. And I'm just sitting here thinking, imagine being an artist and the only thing anyone is looking at is the second picture you ever drew when you were just learning the craft. I just find those early videos way too cringy to go back and watch myself. but. I'm still grateful anyways. And the point is that I will link that video at the end of this one if you do want to see me devote a bit more time to this masterpiece. Uh, just keep in mind that I'm just learning the craft of video making in that one. Meanwhile, here's the short version. This mind-blowing design brings the Lord of the Rings trilogy and many of the key characters therein to life in a way that I have not seen with any other IP-based game, including Star Wars Rebellion. It is truly the epitome of a thematic board game. Both sides play very differently, utilize different characters, leaders, and armies, and have multiple ways they can win. The Fellowship player is primarily trying to get the Ring to Mount Doom before the Ring Bearers become fully corrupted by the darkness of the burden they bear. But if they're very sneaky and a little bit lucky, they might be able to pull off a rare Fellowship military victory. My wife actually managed to pull that off against me once. It was a little humiliating. But at the same time, I was very proud of her clever play. Playing on the Fellowship side can be pretty overwhelming because both the Ring Dunk victory and the Military victory seem completely impossible in the face of overwhelming odds, giving that player a bit of a taste for how Frodo and the Forces of Good must have felt in the face of overwhelming odds in the books. If it was a real thing, not fiction. Anyways. On the dark side of things, the shadow player has to decide how much energy to devote to steamrolling through the smaller fellowship armies en route to a military victory versus harrying the progress of the ring bearer in an effort to win a corruption victory. Sauron must keep his all-seeing eye on both aspects, but while he's looking at one area, he knows that the fellowship forces are gaining ground in the other. Now, despite my own obviously high regard for the game, I would only recommend it to people who A, are fans of Tolkien's books, and B, can find enjoyment in a massive game that takes hours to play and requires devoting a huge amount of time and brain power to learning a lot of rules and rules exceptions and edge cases to the rules and all the little things you need to learn before you even get up and start playing. For people who can check both of those boxes, however, I will say that I have never played a game that is more purely epic per individual game session. Yes, there are campaign-based games and legacy games that are more epic over the scope of a whole multiplayer narrative experience, but nothing I've ever played achieves what War of the Ring can do in a single game session.
and my number one favorite game after being a lifelong avid gamer for 40 something years. Minus about a decade from my late teens to late 20s. Minus those 10 years, for 30 years I've been playing games and Gloomhaven is my number one of all time. This thing was designed by Isaac Childress and published by Cephalofare Games, the one-man design and publishing company. This here is the very first Kickstarter edition. There are no expansions yet, but I am eagerly awaiting the release of the Forgotten Circles expansion because we have just recently finished up our complete campaign for this game. I rate this game a flawless 10 out of 10, and my wife considers it to be one of her very favorite games as well. The number of players stated on the box is 1 to 4. I think the sweet spot for Gloomhaven is 2 or 3 players, but it's certainly doable with 1 or 4 as well. The listed playtime is 30 minutes per player, and that is pretty accurate since our 3 player games take about 1.5 to 2 hours, although I literally spend close to 45 minutes on setting up the game and then over half an hour again to put it all away in the box. So the time spent per game is considerably longer if you take all that stuff into account. And once again, the complexity is also 10 out of 10, which is a weird thing because I don't normally gravitate towards highly complex games. You've seen throughout this top 60 that a lot of the games fall within that three to five maybe in the complexity rating. And it is a little weird to me that these 10 out of 10 games would be right at the very top of that list. But I suppose if I am willing to commit to a game of this complexity and depth, it means that I am quite enthralled with the game itself. So I guess that sort of makes sense. There are loads of rules and the gameplay is very challenging and strategic. Even after more than 50 plays of the game, I'm still not sure if we're getting 100% of the rules correct, but we're doing it well enough to enjoy it anyhow. So in the sixth video I ever made, I spent almost 20 minutes talking about Gloomhaven, and that one has over 10,000 views, leaving me once again positively perplexed and wishing I knew how to make that happen to my more watchable, more recent stuff. But again, I'm just grateful for the views that I get. But let's not focus on me here. Let's put the attention where it belongs, on the absolutely mad mastermind who single-handedly created created this behemoth and that person being Isaac Childress. When I was talking about Spirit Island in my last video, I made the assertion that both our Eric Reyes and Isaac Childress are mad geniuses in a very literal sense. And I think it's even more clear when you start digging into the seemingly endless depths of Gloomhaven. The difference for me with Gloomhaven is that while I was predisposed to love the theme of Spirit Island, I'd have to say the opposite was true for Gloomhaven. I have no interest in the whole dungeon crawler genre. I've never played a role-playing game or one of those dungeon delving video games even. So I don't have that history that leads so many gamers to seek a board game experience that will tickle their nostalgia bone. But I suppose that in the same way that Battles of Westeros gives me sort of a taste for the miniatures genre, but in a much more structured and manageable format, I suppose that Gloomhaven would give me maybe just a taste of that RPG experience, again in a very structured, rules and closed, manageable form. Though I guess if you're making that RPG comparison with Gloomhaven, this game is almost entirely about the combat aspect of the role-playing game and the actual story aspect and the character development and that sort of thing while it is present in the game is a very minimal aspect of it. So with my lack of interest in dungeon crawlers why is this 11 pound brick sitting on my table? Well unlike in War of the Ring where the theme is a big factor in my love of the game here it's all about the gameplay. While the primary mechanism of the card play is unique and interesting, there are so many other things I could talk about, such as the 17 different hero characters, each of whom has a remarkably unique playstyle, or the 34 different types of monsters and 13 different bosses, each of which acts in very unique ways, or the 95 scenarios, of which you'll see roughly half of them during a full campaign as you branch out in different ways and follow different paths depending on the choices you make during your 
your campaign, or the many different ways in which you can customize your heroes with abilities and items as they grow and develop over the course of many scenarios, or the seemingly small decisions you'll make as you resolve road and city events that might actually come back to have an effect later in the campaign, or just how incredibly fun it all is. Not to mention challenging, our group of extremely experienced gamers has been playing on easy level right from the get-go, and while we've only had to replay a handful of scenarios, many of our victories have come right down to the wire still. It is truly a mind-bending, monster-bashing puzzle wrapped up in an ongoing narrative that takes place in a world all of its own. I love the whole concept of legacy-style games, yet outside of the first two seasons of Pandemic Legacy, this is the only one that has truly captivated me. I would have thought you were crazy if you told me I would play this beast over 50 times, yet here we are. This is now the most game in my collection by hours spent playing it. We did it! How fun was that? Although, I do have to say that the kind of depressing thing about doing this final video was just how many of my top 10 games I had to wipe a thick layer of dust off the top of the box before presenting them. That's kind of sad, but we will have a little bit more fun before I wrap it all up here by going all statistical and having a look at some of the interesting things going on behind the scenes of these 60 games I've just gone over. Let me grab my stuff. And here we have my analog PowerPoint presentation. I'm going to start off with all 60 of the board games from the series, and there were a few instances where I had multiple games representing a single entry, such as with my party game grouping of Beyond Balderdash, Why Did the Chicken, and Wise and Otherwise, and the whole Mr. Jack series, and that sort of thing. So in those instances, I tried to choose one representative game for the sake of my stats, such as using Beyond Balderdash for the party group, and Mr. Jack in New New York for that series. So the first thing I'm going to look at is my top 60 games by the year published, starting in the year 2000 and working our way forward to 2019 here. You can see how that distribution of year published looks on the graph. For the sake of not skewing the statistics too badly, I actually left two games off the chart, which is why I have 58 rather than 60. I left off Poker because it has a published date of 1810, according to BoardGameGeek.com. And I also left off that Beyond Balderdash grouping because Beyond Balderdash was published in 1993, which falls well outside of this time frame that I'm looking at. So of the remaining 58 games, the two oldest are 16 years old. Those are Hey That's My Fish and Armadora, which were both published in 2003. Looking at the more recent end of the graph here, it's interesting to note that 28 of the games, which is almost exactly half of them, have been published within the past five years. Although it's also interesting to note that with the titles I looked at, nothing from 2018 had cracked my top 60 list yet. Although, like I said at the beginning of this video, Pandemic Fall of Rome definitely has now, and maybe the Golden Age is also will end up in here. Continuing to look at the recent years, 2016 was obviously below some of the other recent years because there are eight games that have been published in 2015 and 2014, and then seven games from 2017. And looking at popular years outside the past five years, 2010 here really stands out with eight games having come from 2010. It's quite a remarkable difference when you look at the comparison to the years close to it. There's also a pretty good spread across all the years. In the past 16 years, only three have not produced a top 60 game for me, those being 2004, 2006, and 2018. In terms of the average age of the games in my top 60, we have an average age of 6.8 years, which basically brings us to the year 2012 as my average. Now let's narrow up the focus a bit to encompass just my top 20 games. When I do that, 
this is what the chart looks like. Now 2017 becomes the most popular year with 14 and 15 close behind. I guess I should note again that there are only actually 19 games represented here because of the removal of Beyond Balderdash and Why Do the Chicken and Why Isn't Otherwise, that little grouping again. So when we average all of that out, now we have an average age of 6.0 years, which is now 2013 as our average. So when we start to get to my most highly rated games, it skews a little bit more recent with only one game being more than 11 years old. So let's narrow the focus even more and have a look at my top 10 games. Now there are no games older than 10 years old. We have Mr. Jack in New York from 2009, though if I had chosen Mr. Jack, the original base game, to be the representative game in that little grouping, that would go back to 2006. But I don't rate it as highly as Mr. Jack in New York, which is why I have chosen that game to represent my 2009 spot here. Other than that, my favorite games are spread fairly evenly over the past 10 years, with only, again, a few years not being represented, 2011, 13, and 18. And once again, the average age is going to end up being very slightly more new than the top 20. I have the average age at 5.8 years now, which would put us at 2013. So we've gone with the top 60 games from an average age of 6.8 years down to an average age of 5.8 years when looking at just the top 10. So now we're going to leave behind the years published and look at one more interesting thing. When I was doing the research for this video, I was reading some old stuff I had written on Board Game Geek about Clash of Cultures, and I found an old review I had written for that game. What was interesting to me was within that review, I had listed my top 20 games at that time as a way for people to understand what sorts of games I liked when they were reading my review of Clash of Cultures. That review was written on almost exactly six years ago to the day on February 12th, 2013. So now I can compare the top 20 games from six years ago to the list that I just went over now. So this is the top 20 games that I have just gone over in the past two videos. And for comparison, these were my top 20 games from six years ago. Feel free to pause the video if you want to have a look through the whole list. But next up, we have the rank of each game as they are ranked now. So that is the column for the current rankings of those games. And then the final one is the difference in ranking for each individual game. Now the first thing you'll notice is that War of the Ring and Mr. Jack in New York used to be my positions 1 and 2. Now they are still up at 2 and 3, but they've been bumped down one spot by Gloomhaven. Battles of Westeros is still pretty much where it was six years ago. It's only gone down three positions. But the next one, Attack, with the Attack Deluxe expansion, has dropped all the way from number 4 to number 91. That's because I am largely not so much into those huge games of Conquest, the 4X style games. And actually, there are only going to be four games beneath it in my entire collection once I get my next game auction underway and get some more games sold. Hey, That's My Fish has dropped 24 positions. Fury of Dracula 2nd Edition has dropped 38. And since this was done six years ago, Fury of Dracula 3rd Edition was released. And then the whole thing was basically taken over by Spectre Ops as being my number one game in that genre. We have Poker going down about 17 positions. We have Railways of the World slash Railroad Tycoon, which has dropped quite a bit, 35 places. The whole ball 
Balderdash series of games has stayed quite constant, has only dropped two spots. Chaos in the Old World as well is only down five from 10 to 15. Manila is also pretty steady, only dropping nine spots. We have Piggy Roden has gone down quite a bit. And the first one that has gone up in the ranking is The Boss, which has gone up six positions to my top 10 at number seven here, which I don't know if I've played The Boss in the six years since I ranked it there. I'm sure I've had one or two games since then, but not very many. Maybe it's all in my memory how great it was. But the next game too here, Clash of Cultures, has gone up nine positions all the way up to number five. It's interesting for me to see that I have both Clash of Cultures and Merchants and Marauders next to each other in that old ranking because they're both by the same designer. But whereas Clash of Cultures rose nine positions, Merchants and Marauders dropped 12. And now we're finally at the first game that I no longer have in my collection, which is Bootleggers. It was a pretty decent old uh, sort of worker placement type of game that I enjoyed a lot. It was quite a great game, but you know, I have so many great games on my shelf that I can only keep so many. And so that one has been sold off. Nexus Ops here has dropped 20 spots. Yager on Sammler has also dropped 22. We have Himalaya, which, as I said, later became re-released and redone as Lords of Zidit. And I guess I enjoyed that new version even more than Himalaya, because it's climbed five positions. And then the only other game that I no longer own is Defenders of the Realm, which was at my number 20 and now is not in my collection. And just a few interesting stats relating to the comparison of these two lists. We have the number of top 20 games from 2013 that are still in my top 20, and that number is nine. So nearly half of the games that were in my top 20 six years ago are still in my top 20 today, which I think is pretty remarkable that those games have had that much staying power. Once we go further than that, the number of top 20 games from six years ago that are at least in my top 60 that I have gone over in this series, we have 17 of those games are still in the top 60. Only three are no longer there. And then if we go all the way up to our top 10, so the number of top 20 games for 2013 that are in my current top 10 are five. So half of the games in my top 10 are six years old or older, I guess is what this means. So this sort of makes sense to the way I cycle through games where I sort of keep the best of the best, sell off the others, bring in new stuff, let it have some time to see how it goes, whether it ends up sticking around or getting sold. Over time then, the ones that I most enjoy end up sticking around and rising to the top and I end up having a mix of games that are both newer and older. I just found all that really interesting, don't know if you do, but that was my high-tech look at some statistics related to my top board games. And that's all I've got for my top 60 games. If you missed any of the previous videos, you can definitely find them in my YouTube channel. And if there were any games I hit along the way that you'd like to see me discuss in more detail in another video, do let me know. Like I said, I am going to have a look at the Mr. Jack family of games just because it's a game that I've been fascinated by for so long now. So I'll get to that sometime in the near future. And in the meantime, thanks so much for watching. I hope you've had fun. I'm done. I'm done. I'm done, I'm done, I'm done, I'm done. Oh my gosh, I am so glad somebody took the time to watch this video. If you could just do me one more favor and consider giving me a thumb up, maybe subscribe to my channel, or share the link to this video with somebody who you think would enjoy it, I would really appreciate that. Cheers. I'm going to start off with a couple of, what are they called? Um, uh, um, honorable mentions. Of, what's it called? Um, uh, script? Um, what am I looking for? Yes. No. Yes. And uh, what is my point? And there really are only a few games that I don't own that might crap the, crap the top 60. And fewer opportunities to see your carefully crafted plans come to fruition. Carefully crafted plans. The most valuable treasures are the farthest uh, down. The I injured myself somehow. They too. T
They do tend to include scenarios for sure. I rate the game 9 out of 10 and my I rate and I love how the game resolves resolves revolves. I came here all prepared to complain about the fact that commands Top five time now with Clash of Cultures coming in at, at that number five. And all of Arthur Ignatius Conan. And then they came out with a mu Hi. Hi. It was all designed by, no it wasn't. I need to sit on a pillow or something. So I, so I guess if you were to make... So I guess in that comparison... The, the, or the 34. Or the 34. Testing, 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 testing! Now the... Uh, this battery's about to die too. So this is... So this is... Uh, that's partly because first it was replaced by. Whoops. It's interesting for me to see that I have Clash of Cultures and Merchants and Rock. It's interesting. And that's all I've got for my top 60 games. I have. Let's see. Nope.